Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our fall 2008 meeting of the President's Club. I'm so glad to see we have a number of new members. And for those of you who are attending for the first time, I extend a very special welcome to you. I've met a number of you already, and we are so glad you're here. And also a very special word of welcome to the members of our Young President's Club. We were very glad today that at lunchtime we had a lunch meeting of the Young President's Club. We had more than 100 people there, and you represent the newest generation of conservative leaders, so thank you, too, for being here. Now, on the off chance that there might be some confusion on this point, let me explain that President's Club doesn't refer to the current or future occupant of 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. It actually refers to me. My name's Ed Fulner, and I am the president of the Heritage Foundation, which I have been for some years. I thank all of you for coming. Welcome to Washington, despite my repeated admonition that remember the two biggest lies in the world are number one, the checks in the mail, and number two, I'm from Washington. I'm here to help you. <laughs> well, the election was held six days ago. The results are long since in. Is everybody happy? Yeah, I'll take that as a no. Under the circumstances, I think it's very appropriate for conservatives to feel unhappy about the outcome of this election, very unhappy. And it might be helpful if we take just a few moments to kind of wallow in our misery. Consider this. The Liberals, Democrats, now hold 56 seats in the Senate, 58% of the House. The hard-won tax cuts of 2001 and 2003 are set to expire in two years. Whether they do expire is left to the tender mercies of those Democratic majorities, but I wouldn't hold your breath. Barney Franks already declared that taxes will have to be increased. And Nancy and Harry fall asleep each night with visions of New Deal II dancing in their heads. And their legislation will go to a president whose views on wealth and taxation sound more like Karl Marx than James Madison. Well, I could go on with a list of horribles, but that should be enough to have us all reaching for the Prozac. Rather than try to elevate our spirits through chemistry, Let's try this. For the next few minutes, let's use our brains and our native good sense as conservatives to appraise the mess we seem to be in. After all, it isn't as though we haven't been in messes before. Turn your internal clocks back 30 years to the late 1970s. See if you can call up a vivid picture of those times. Jimmy Carter was in the White House. The Democrats held 61 seats in the Senate, 67% of the House. We had 12% inflation, 9% unemployment. The top marginal income tax rate was 70%. We had an Arab oil embargo that compelled us to buy gas on odd and even days when gasoline was available, and oftentimes it wasn't. Rather than encouraging domestic oil production, our government was penalizing oil companies with windfall profits taxes. We were ordered to turn our thermostats up in the summer and down in the winter and wear sweaters. We were at the height of the Cold War. Iran had been holding 52 Americans hostage for more than a year, delighted to stick its thumb in the eye of the ugly Americans. Our president added scorn to ridicule by mounting a rescue mission that crashed and burned in the desert. I could go on, but let me just sum it up by modifying the line from Charles Dickens. It was the worst of times. It was the worst of times. <laughs> we were entitled to feel unhappy then, just as we're entitled to feel unhappy now. But we're not entitled to despondency and pessimism, not then and not now. Despondency and pessimism are a form of self-indulgence that we cannot afford and which cannot be justified by the facts. Let's look at the facts for a minute. The dark days of the Carter era were not our political destiny. It might have seemed so then in the middle of them, but it plainly wasn't so in hindsight. 
During those years, we were served with feckless failed leadership. By the end of that administration, Americans had grown sick of failure, so they turned to new leadership. Now, it's a characteristic peculiar to Americans that when we finally had enough of a bad thing, we turned very decisively. We owe our national origins to that tendency. When the colonists had had enough of British tyranny, they turned decisively and founded a new nation. In every national crisis since our founding, that distinctive American impulse to create our own destiny has pulled us through. The Carter administration was one of those dark times, and you know where we turned then. We returned, we turned to the California cowboy, to Ronald Reagan, to principled leadership, to conservative leadership, to courageous leadership. Weary of the darkness, we opted for sunrise. Decisive turns like that don't happen by chance. We can't chalk them up to luck. When our country strays off course, we the people bring it back on course because there are always enough of us with the courage and brains and determination to make it happen. Living proof of that courage, brains, and determination is seated in this room today, and I thank you for it. In order to succeed, though, we have to avoid certain errors in our thinking. Paul Newman died a couple months ago. You remember 1967, Cool Hand Luke? Luke was sentenced to a southern prison camp where he kept stirring up trouble and trying to escape. Each time they'd lock him up in the box for a while, in solitary confinement. After one stint in the box, he was hauled before the prison boss for a lecture. In a voice that sounded like a dentist drill with a southern drawl, the boss told Luke, you're going to get your mind right, and I mean right. Well, today, a lot of conservatives need to get their minds right. And the first order of business is to stop equating the Republican Party with the conservative movement. Our opponents on the left are happy to draw this false parallel. Go back just two years before the 2006 elections, columnist E.J. Dionne of the Washington Post wrote a column arguing that the GOP was headed for defeat that year and that this would be a setback for all conservatives and the decline of conservatism, in quotes. According to Dionne, the failures of the Republican Party in 06 were a failure of the conservative movement. Then just a couple months ago, the left-wing American Prospect magazine wrote an article entitled the coming conservative crack-up. After what he saw as fatal Republican mistakes in the presidential campaign, author Paul Waldman concluded, and I quote, in other words, all the pillars that have held up conservatism for so long are crumbling. There it is again. If the GOP fails, conservatism must be crumbling. Last spring, the New Yorker ran a widely discussed article by George Packer titled, listen to this, The Fall of Conservatism Have the Republicans Run Out of Ideas. That's the actual title of the article. The title itself commits the same error. Republican failures are interpreted as the fall of conservatism. Now, I expect this from our opponents on the left. They will seize upon any pretext to announce the death of the conservative movement. They've been doing that for the last several decades. But too many conservatives today are buying into that fallacy. That's a dangerous mistake because it will sap your will to fight. If you believe that the current sorry state of the GOP is a measure of the health of conservatism, then you're bound to conclude that the conservative movement is done for. But. If you want to see when conservatives were in trouble, go back 35 years to 1973. 
That's the year we opened the doors at Heritage. We were just a handful of people in a few rented rooms. The only Washington think tank on the conservative side anybody knew anything about was our friends at the American Enterprise Institute. Now, they turned out some fine research, but they consciously didn't get involved in policy battles. They deliberately stayed out of them and above the fray, as their then president told me. At that time, there were no cable outlets like Fox. There were no conservative talk radio hosts because the fairness doctrine was still in effect, and that prevented conservatives from having their own programs. Rush Limbaugh was a disc jockey in Missouri. Sean Hannity was in the seventh grade, and Laura Ingram was in the fifth grade. <laughs> Al Gore hadn't invented the internet yet, so <laughs> there were no conservative bloggers exposing the biases of mainstream media and also delivering conservative commentary to millions of readers. In those days, the conservative movement was in real trouble. But it didn't know it because it barely existed. Today, the Republican Party is in real trouble, serious trouble of its own making. But the conservative movement is not in decline. In fact, the conservative movement is in robust good health and growing stronger with every passing year. Let me give you some evidence. In addition to the best known media that presents conservative ideas, at least fairly and balanced, like Fox, hundreds of talk radio programs, scores of national magazines, conservatives have in fact achieved a staggering presence on the internet. Townhall.com is the largest conservative portal on the World Wide Web. Visit that site and you'll find links to 450 columnists, to 100 partner organizations that include conservative think tanks and other policy organizations, and to more than 8,000 internet blogs dedicated to every conceivable issue. 8,000. Never in our history have conservatives enjoyed more channels of communication, buzzing with our ideas and reaching into every corner of America. And never in our history have we had a more potent source of conservative ideas. I'm referring to the idea factories, the conservative think tanks, and your Heritage Foundation is widely recognized as the leader in that category. We earn that recognition for a number of reasons, and one of the most important is that we have spent decades linking with other conservative organizations, cultivating their growth, helping them to share resources and coordinate strategy. We do this in many ways, but primarily through our resource bank. Little factoids. Ten years ago, the 1998 annual meeting of the resource bank, we had 292 individuals representing 175 organizations. This year, April, Atlanta, we registered 708 individuals, 386 organizations, almost 400 organizations, 52 countries. More than 200 of those 700 individuals were presidents and CEOs of conservative organizations, more than 200. Years ago, our late friend and heritage trustee, Tom Rowe, had the idea of starting state-based conservative think tanks, patterned after heritage, but concentrating on state and local issues. He and I and the Heritage Board had long discussions about this. Did we want to become McDonald's and put out franchises? No, that wouldn't work. Every state has its own set of dynamics. They've got to do their own thing. So as these different state conservative think tanks evolve, yes, we were happy to provide them with bylaws, with outlines on how to get started. And Tom put up the seed money to start the first ones. Then in 1992, he founded the State Policy Network so these groups could share their expertise and learn from each other's mistakes and successes. At that time, there were about a dozen of them. That's not long ago. 
Today, there are 55 state think tanks in all 50 states with a combined budget approaching $60 million. And those numbers continue to grow, and they are having an impact from state to state and county to county. Now, I mention those details because they illustrate just how serious a mistake it is to equate the Republican Party with the conservative movement. With those details in mind, and I've only touched the surface this this afternoon. Listen again to that line I quoted earlier from Waldman, quote, all the pillars that have held up conservatism for so long are crumbling. That's nonsense. The pillars that hold up conservatism are not the leaders of the Republican Party. Conservatism is sustained and nurtured primarily in the institutions of civil society. Conservatism is kept alive in our families, in our religious institutions, in our businesses, in the mass media, including radio, television, and the internet, in charitable and civic organizations of endless variety that so many of you are involved in at the state and local level, in hundreds of think tanks and allied organizations operating at the national level and state levels among thousands of principled conservative experts in every field of policy work, and among millions of principled conservatives like those of you here. These are the pillars that hold up conservatism, and they are not crumbling. The conservative movement will encompass all the differing schools that it has encompassed since World War II. But those differences haven't crippled us with division and strife. Conservatives are working cooperatively in larger and more effective networks than ever before. Despite the results of the election, America remains essentially a center-right nation with a conservative outlook on core issues. Post-election analysis reconfirmed it. Twice as many Americans still identify themselves as conservatives as than as liberals. Asked by the Gallup poll whether government should redistribute wealth more evenly or improve the overall economy to create more jobs, 84% of the American people chose the latter. Even among Democrats, only 17% said the government should focus on redistributing wealth. Asked by the Pew Organization about the main causes of the financial crisis, 79% of Americans said the main factor was people taking on more debt than they could afford. A removal from that traditional American belief in thrift. These aren't positions on policies, I'll admit, but they do reflect underlying values that are essentially conservative on such questions as the basic functions of government and the personal virtues of working and living within our means. And those values are not consistent with the left's agenda, which is why in the last few weeks you heard candidate Obama emphasizing tax cuts rather than the enormous costs of his liberal proposals. Look at our popular culture and you will still see more roots of conservatism. Americans are still a people who feel a sense of reverence and gratitude when we hear songs with titles like God Bless America, The Star-Spangled Banner, America the Beautiful, and The Stars and Stripes Forever. We're still a nation that pauses tomorrow on Veterans Day, on Independence Day, on Memorial Day, and on Thanksgiving to give thanks to a supreme being for the blessings of freedom. Visit any town in America and you'll find memorials and monuments erected to honor the troops who fought and died for our country. These are tangible expressions of our understanding that freedom isn't free and that we must always fight to preserve it. They are tangible expressions of conservative values. Conservatives today command enormous resources for presenting and defending our ideas. The underlying conservative sentiments of the American people offer the potential for these ideas to take root. But realizing that potential is a huge challenge. 
Both political parties have failed us. But to my mind, the greatest fault lies with the Republican Party. It fi failed not by embracing the wrong principles, but by abandoning its principles, its conservative principles. That's why we at the Heritage Foundation have embarked on our 10-year Leadership for America campaign that you've heard me talk about before. Now, more than ever, we must stand by our principles and teach them to the widest possible audience. We must revive broader understanding and respect for the timeless truths that are the foundations of American life. As you may know, during the last two years, we've increased our operating budget by almost 50 percent. A large part of that increase has been and will be used to fund a greatly expanded effort to deliver our ideas to wider audiences. We'll continue to put ads on radio programs that reach tens of millions of Americans every week. In fact, I think I can say it. In fact, we're starting with Rush in January. We've just signed a contract with him. We've just launched our ninth community committee in southern Florida. And we'll hold more heritage events around the country to engage local leaders and build the grassroots to demand greater accountability from Washington. We have marketing and communications experts who maintain close working relationships with producers at national radio and television outlets, including those of the mainstream media. That's a capacity we've been building for many years, and it's going to pay big dividends in the current policy environment. Given the results of the election, it's obvious that the Congress and the White House will not be as receptive to many conservative ideas as we'd all like. So frankly, we'll be playing a great deal more defense. And there will be plenty of defense to play as the liberals try to redistribute wealth, abolish the right of workers to cast secret ballots in union elections, nationalize health care slash defense spending, bankrupt energy companies that use coal, and the list goes on and on. But there's good news here, too. Conservatives are better equipped than ever before to play defense. We have analytical resources like our Center for Data Analysis, we have a vibrant network of allied organizations that can be mobilized very quickly. We have a virtual army of bloggers who can alert tens of millions of Americans literally within hours. And we have some of the best educated and most experienced policy experts in the world, some of whom you'll be hearing from in the next couple of hours. No, this isn't a time for despondency. It's a time for optimism. This isn't a time to look backward with nostalgia or with regret. We need to look forward with hope and purpose and commitment. This isn't the time to let political setbacks drain our resolve. It's the time to remember that progress doesn't follow a straight line. Setbacks are a natural part of gaining ground. I've taken some pains today to distinguish the conservative movement from the Republican Party. But I didn't do that on the assumption that you don't understand that distinction. You plainly do understand it or you wouldn't be here. Because that is why you're gathered here today as members of the Heritage Foundation. That's why one of you sent me an email not long ago saying, Ed, as far as I'm concerned, Heritage is my representative in Washington. You unite under our shared banner because you understand that we are not politicians who will abandon our ideas. You trust Heritage to remain a principled conservative institution that will defend your ideas. You know there are no permanent victories in Washington and that Heritage is involved in these major issues and these major battles for the long haul. I say for the long haul 
because heritage is now a permanent institution that will represent your values long into the future. You show your trust with your generous financial support, and without that, we couldn't operate. So I want to say at this time, thank you most sincerely. Thank you for remaining committed to your conservative ideals. Thank you for investing your time, your energy, and your money in the cause of preserving those ideals. You're doing some of the most noble work a citizen of this country can do, participating directly in the policy process. And I salute you for it. I know some of you are feeling dispirited right now. Disastrous elections can do that. My message to you today can be summed up in three words. Stay the course. That isn't easy to do at times like this. So I want to close with a little story about determination. I'm sure you've heard it before. It's a timely reminder of the power of determination when the odds appear to be against us. Back in December 1920, a young man named George Gipp had reached a pinnacle of achievement. Gipp was in his senior year at Notre Dame. He entered school as a boy who had never played sports. He finished as one of the greatest college football players of all time. And now in his senior year, he was dying of an infectious disease. His coach, Newt Rockney, went to pay him his last visit. Gip said to Rockney, I've got to go, Rock. It's all right. I'm not afraid. But sometime, Rock, when the team's up against it, when things are wrong and the brakes are beating the boys, tell them to go in there with all they've got and win just one for the Gipper. The following day, George Gip died. For the next eight years, Newt Rockney kept those words to himself. When he finally revealed them, it was exactly 80 years ago today. On the afternoon of November 10, 1928, Notre Dame was pitted against Army at Yankee Stadium. In those days, Army was the greatest rival of the Fighting Irish. And Notre Dame was having its worst season in Rockney's career. His team was riddled with injuries. Army's team was undefeated. The prospects looked miserable. And the fighting Irish didn't have much fight left in them, kind of the way many conservatives are feeling right about now. Well, you know how the game turned out. Notre Dame beat Army. And the fighting Irish didn't win just because they had a playbook and strategies for playing offense and defense. They needed those things, of course but they won because they were able to summon up an unshakable determination to fight and to win against great odds. Rockney awakened that determination in them with his famous pregame speech. It was reported in the New York News as follows. The day before he died, Rockney told them, George Gipp asked me to wait until the situation seemed hopeless and then ask a Notre Dame team to go out and beat Army for him. This is the day and you are the team. Let's win one for the Gipper. Everybody here today knows that conservatives aren't playing a game. Policy making ain't football. The outcome of our efforts won't be determined in the course of a day or even a year. But success will be determined by our unfailing will to succeed. We can never accept failure as our destiny. Never, ever. Fix in your minds and resolve in your hearts that we'll all stand united and defend our priceless legacy of freedom. Don't just make a mental note to do that later. Make it a fully conscious commitment and do it on a date certain. Make today that date. We're the team. 
and we will prevail. Thank you. <laughs> Questions, have at me. Yes. Pep talk, Ed. Uh, we love to come here, even from all the way across the country. Now, we're all a little despondent. One of the bright things that our way came was Sarah Palin. We know why the Democrats and liberals have opposed her so much they're terrified of her. Why have some Republicans opposed Sarah Palin? Two reasons. One, sheer intellectual arrogance from part of the Eastern uh, feet intellectual snobs, and number two, some of the people involved in the campaign are looking for excuses and looking for fall guys. I don't think it's going to hurt her. I think it's just going to reinforce her. She's, it'll keep her on the front pages. She's, as I understand it, from talking to people who are close to her, she's had more invitations to give talks, to get to be present, to, to help communicate the message than she ever imagined she would have from people who know her. I've shaken hands with her one time, and that's it. Uh, but from people who know her, uh, she is really buoyed up, and she's, she's ready to go. I mean, and what a breath of fresh air. And to say that, 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 that she was unqualified to be a heartbeat away. How about the guy whose heart's going to be beating and who won? I mean, you know, hey. Uh, next. Have you invited Sarah to talk to you talk to us here? We have. It's pending. <laughs> as soon as we can make it happen. Oh, I'm sorry. Have we invited Sarah to speak to us? Yes, we have. <laughs> it's pending. For obvious reasons, she wants to sort a few things out. <laughs> what role are you going to play in uh, defeating the reemergence of the fairness doctrine? Wow. Good question. What role will Heritage play in defeating the reemergence of the fairness doctrine? Let me give you one of the ideas that we're just thinking through right now. One of the supporters of bringing the Fairness Doctrine back has said their objective is going to be to have individuals go to every local station that carries a, basically a conservative talk show and tell them that they don't like it, that they want to get rid of it. Well, Heritage has grown in the last year from 225,000 to almost 400,000 members. It seems to me this would be a great project to get our membership mobilized on, to go down to those same stations to make sure that they know we do want them on there. There are a lot of things that can happen to stop that sort of nuttiness uh, from happening. I mean, the notion, you have to live in Washington to believe some of this stuff. Sunday, uh, yesterday, the Washington Post's ombudsman did a reflective look at the Washington Post during the last two months and decided that the Washington Post showed a prejudice toward Barack Obama as opposed to John McCain. <laughs> Duh. You know, five days after the election, we're told this. Uh, you know, they've already got the whole mainstream media. They've got the drive-by media, as I prefer to call it. They've got the, the three networks. They've, but they want, to, they want to quiet us down. They want to silence us because they don't want, they don't believe in competition of ideas. We do because our ideas are right. We'll take them on anytime. That's why we've got such strength at the grassroots. That's why we need to rebuild that strength at the grassroots as a movement. But there will be, fairness doctrine is uh, not a done deal. It's not coming back just yet. We'll be in there leading the charge, I can assure you. Yeah, yeah. We got to we got to come up with a better one. Yeah, it's it's like well, what what do the unions call card check? They call it uh, uh, free choice or something. Uh, you know, geez, 
free choice. You got five union goons coming in and saying, do you or don't you want a union? <laughs> oh, well, yeah, and they're looking at their kids and his wife, and yeah, you know, man, what are they, what's he going to say? Uh, you're right, and yeah, Gladstone said 150 years ago, it's with words that we govern men. We've got to We've got to come back. Right, good case in point. Uh, our colleague, Brian Riedel, in his op-ed piece in the New York Post 10 days ago, when he came out in opposition to this goofy notion that TARP, the bailout, ought to be used to bail out the state governments. Uh, well, I mean, Brian didn't go into offsets and countervailing uh, receipts and expenditures. He said, to do this, is the equivalent of you writing a check on your visa account to pay off your MasterCard. Now that's the kind of language that people understand. And that's what we, both at Heritage and elsewhere in the conservative movement, have got to get better at in terms of communicating our message. And we are getting there. We are getting better at it, but it's sometimes we got to not talk so much in policy. Policy won't talk. Back there, Jim. Uh, yes, sir. Getting back to Sarah Palin, I'm, I'm just wondering if the Heritage Foundation has any interest or desire not only just to have her speak to us, but to help present her uh, to the public, to uh, not just with her, but other politicians that we feel might be able to uh, bring back new conservatism to, uh, to our side. Do we, we are always anxious and eager to bring forward political leaders who share the views that undergird the principles at Heritage. One thing we don't do is we don't bend those principles to, to suit the politicians. Those of you who are at our executive committee lunch today, you heard one of the real leaders of principled conservatism in the House of Representatives, Congressman Mike Pence, who will apparently next week unopposed be elected as chairman of the House Republican Conference, the number three job among the House of House Republicans. Uh, Mike is not only a product of the conservative movement, he was the first president of the Indiana State Think Tank, State Conservative Think Tank. Mike understands it very well. In fact, I have a little card from Mike right in front, right next to the telephone, in front of a little stand on my desk uh, it's a note that he wrote me on the day that he and 27 other Republican House members had the guts to vote against prescription drug, uh, the prescription drug bailout, the largest single expansion of the welfare state since LBJ. And it was a note of congratulations from Mike to me and to Heritage because about an hour and a half earlier, uh, the then majority whip, Tom DeLay, had thrown us out of his office because we were thwarting his plans to impose prescription drug plans on us. Well, Mike, Mike Pence showed his heroism to stand up for principles when it, when it was not a popular thing to do. And again, we at Heritage will always want to stand by politicians in whatever party when they stand up for the right things, when they share the ideas that undergird what Heritage is all about. So we look for opportunities to do that. Yes. Ellen, hi. I'm sorry about your mother. I just Thank you. got the word, yeah. Thanks, She's Ed. in our prayers. Yeah. I appreciate that. One of the things that is really hurting the Republican Party as a, uh, as a conservative uh, voice is open primaries where in the early primary days you have Democrats and independents making the decisions that influence the outcome of our presidential uh, nominee, nomination process. And I'm wondering, has, is Heritage looking at all at that issue of open primaries? We haven't been uh, looking at cases like open primaries. We, had, we did a lot of work in the last three months with the former uh, Federal Election Commissioner von Spasowski on uh, what was going on in terms of voter fraud, in terms of the whole ACORN efforts, et cetera. Uh, in terms of primaries, 
I don't know. It's, it's a good question, Ellen. It's one that we should probably kick around. One of the points I always make is that there are kind of two kinds, two basic branches of politics. Electoral politics, that's what we've just been through, and policy politics. And basically, heritage as an institution doesn't get involved in electoral politics. What happens is the American people uh, deal the deck and we'll have to play the hand we're dealt. Uh, this time, <laughs> it's, a, it's a tough, tough hand. Uh, but in terms of the structure, we have, as you know, in the past opposed rather outspoken ways things like McCain-Feingold and the irony of John McCain being hoisted on his own petard by so many of the rules and regulations that he's forced on everybody else in the whole system uh, on, on questions like uh, voter ID and voter fraud and issues like that. But in terms of the primaries, no, we haven't looked at it. And it's, I'll take it back. It's an interesting idea. I'm, I'm not sure that whether we do have a role to look at it or not, but it's, it's one to worth, worth talking about internally. Thank you, Ellen. Yes. Human events recently quoted Barack Obama as saying the war in court didn't go far enough in getting rid of the musty ideas of the founding fathers. <coughs> it seems to me the Supreme Court is one of our most serious problems. And, you know, this musty little document called the Constitution of the United States that we've now distributed more than a million copies of is uh, still the lodestar, if you will, for what we're all about. You have to think, and again, my, my plea to be positive and uh, forward-looking Boy, when you think about a Stevens, probably you know, sitting over there uh, going gaga, waiting till January 21st when he can resign, uh, or somebody else over there. Uh, and everybody here knows just how delicate that balance is, not only on the Supreme Court, but on the appeals courts as well. Uh, and it's, it, it, they will be serious battles uh, with our Center for Legal and Judicial Studies at Heritage, we are going to be prepared to look very intensively at anybody who's put forward for any senior judicial uh, position uh, and make sure that whoever they are, that they're actually willing to judge cases on the merits and on the law, uh, not on the basic of, basis of their own political philosophy. That's why that's one of our 10 Leadership for America initiatives is to pull the whole judicial system out of the political process. That's not what judges are supposed to do. They're supposed to be impartial arbiters. Um, it's going to be tough. Right down here. Yes. Uh, I just wanted to make a comment about the primary process. I mean, open primaries is obviously a problem, but uh, th there is another problem with the primaries, and that is if you have several candidates, uh, very solid conservatives, let's say, running from the Republican Party, uh, they are likely competing for the same pool of votes, and then you have somebody like John McCain uh, arguably competing, for, uh, competing with no one and, and getting relatively small percentage of votes. This is uh, the problem with the primary process. And, and the way to fix it would be uh, to allow each voter to give one vote for as many candidates on the roster as, as one chooses. <laughs> and, 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 and then the one with the, the most votes wins. So, like, like, yeah. like, like, like in this, in this primary, for example, I think Fred Thompson, uh, Mitt Romney, and Rudy Giuliani, from my perspective, were competing for my vote. I really didn't know who to give my vote to. Yeah. I, uh, I'm not sure quite how to, uh, how to solve that 
that problem uh, in, in terms of primaries. Uh, uh, other than to say by uh, November 4th, there were a lot of us who were certainly getting pretty tired of the whole electoral process. Uh, that's, that is an interesting uh, kind of way to go at it, though. I don't know. I'll leave that to somebody else. Maybe one more. Ed, um, that musty document you have in your pocket, if you go to Article 1, Section 8, which is the Enumerated Powers Clause, and you look through that, can you tell me where in the Constitution it subscribes or it speaks to health care, retirement systems, and other items which we pay about two-thirds of our $3 trillion for each year that are not enumerated in that document, and how we change that? You know, I, I see uh, borrow money. I see uh, provide for a Navy. Uh, no, no, you're absolutely right. This is an argument that a lot of us make repeatedly uh, in, in speeches, in newspaper columns. It's one of the things, frankly, that we are kind of forthwith with all heritage publications, we're going to have a reference back to first principles. What part of the Constitution is this supporting, if it's missile defense? Is it opposing, if it's another intrusion of government into the economy? Uh, to go back to first principles, to relate what these guys and, and gals on Capitol Hill are, are actually doing that either supports or violates the Constitution. Uh, the American people need to be reminded of it. And that's why, you know, we're proud of the fact that we have given away a million copies of the Constitution, but we're kind of shocked that people don't get it in their high school civics class or whatever. As Churchill said in a different context, so little done, so much left to do. Last one. Um, th th this doesn't necessarily require a response, so it'll be quick. It's clear to me the Republican Party is at a low point, at least of my experience. Um, it's also clear to me that the Heritage Foundation is probably not a coincidence, is at a high point of my, uh, of our, uh, in my experience. Um, as I think you are, Dr. Fulner, that la that's, I've heard lots of your speeches. Um, not all of them have kept me awake at night. <laughs> <laughs> This one will. That's the best you've done. Thank you. We needed that, Dr. Fulner. Well, I appreciate that on two counts. I guess I'm uh, driving Ambien out of business on the one score with some of the other ones, but I do hope uh, it'll be uh, up and posted, I think, on myheritage.org, so you can uh, watch it there if you're of a mind. But there are two points that I would, <laughs> without being overly self-serving, one is heritage now more than ever. We need a national permanent institution in Washington to speak for the values and the principles that the people in this room represent. And we are, frankly, are in a better position to do it than anybody else. Others can get in and, and we do, as you know, get in and get very specific on a particular bill or a particular act or piece of legislation. But we also need to enumerate those basic principles and premises that let this country become what it is. And that's one reason, I think, why it's so important, heritage now more than ever. The other point is something that many of you have seen in our publications over the years. And it's one of the reasons why I am so enthusiastic about the fact that we now have 100 members of the Young Presidents Club here with us today, and that we had a lunch with them here with their own program to listen to a couple of young people. Somebody said, well, they're young enough to be your kids, Fulner. I said, no, actually, they're 10 years younger than my kids. Uh, uh, but. Uh, uh, talking about blogging and how to reach out to the new generation. One of our other themes that you've seen in our publications is 
without a heritage, every generation starts over. And that's true whether you're talking about us as an institution or whether you're talking about this. Without a heritage, every generation starts over. And we can't let that happen because of the problems of K-12 education or the diseducating of kids when they go away to college. We've got to remind them what the country's all about. And that's why what we are trying to do in terms of first principles, I think, is so especially important. And that, again, is why what you are doing to work with us, not just here in Washington, but through our community committees and through the expanded targeted education we're going to be involving in, involving ourselves in in the months ahead. It's an exciting time, really, to be a conservative in Washington. And I hope you consider it an exciting time to be a conservative in the United States because we're right, we've got the right ideas, and we've got to go out and really make sure the rest of the country appreciates it. Thanks very much for being here.